Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Smith, First Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, I'm here with you for another Bible study broadcast uh, on Facebook. Our It's under our First Gospel Church dash Pastor Smith page. And I uh, want to just welcome everyone this evening and Tell you that I do count it a privilege to have the technology that we have today to be able to uh, reach out uh, in this way uh, online and uh, be able to have a Bible study. People can receive it right in their homes and even cast it to their TV or however they want to watch it. So um, it's just good to be with you today. We had a there's a virtual meeting online like this that the Montreal churches in Canada are having today. And we were on that uh, virtual meeting with them today earlier. And uh, they had different speakers, uh, Brother Hogarth Lewis, and Brother, and then they had me after him, and then Brother, uh, Brother Glenn Goodman of Des Moines, Iowa. So, uh, and of course they had, they had more and they're continuing that meeting for three days. So it's really interesting how that this pandemic that we have is, has brought about uh, new methods for us to be able to reach out, uh, you know, to our people in a different way. And so uh, I've been, <clears throat> I, I had intentions on starting our Wednesday night services back up. Uh, and I had an, originally announced that we'd started up the first Wednesday of July. I, at the time that I announced that, I didn't really realize that it was going to be right after 4th of July weekend. And then prior to that, this new Delta variant of the COVID-19 uh, virus had broke out uh, just above us in Missouri and they had a quite a breakout there in fact all the hospitals filled up and um, so uh, it has came down into Arkansas now we're listed with one of the five states that's having this spike in the COVID uh, uh, new cases of COVID. And so I've, I've held off I, until this goes back down. I just hate for us to start up uh, in a time when there's a spike in, in this new uh, uh, variant of the, of the virus. And, you know, many people are still unvaccinated. I, uh, I had a um, report about the Baptist Hospital here in Little Rock, Arkansas, just a couple of days ago that there were like 55 new people hospitalized and uh, uh, someone had heard that it was people that, uh, that there were many of the people had had the vaccine but then yesterday I was uh, I was given information from the hospital administrator that it's that that part was not true that almost every one of the people in there are unvaccinated and I understand that there's many people that are still very leery about the vaccine and uh, you know I think. Uh, that could be rightfully so in different in in different people's minds, because I again I've stated before, I don't think I or any minister actually ought to be trying to uh, make the decision whether or not to get the vaccine or not to get it. It's true. There's a lot about it that we don't know. Um, what we are finding out is, is that people that don't have it are definitely the great, great number that are not, that are getting 
the virus as far as knowing what the vaccine, you know, how long it'll last, what it'll accomplish, how safe it is. Um, you know, I guess we just have to trust the medical profession. And that's why I don't think that I, uh, even though I was a physician's assistant in the army, I got out of the army in 1970. That's been 50 years ago. And I haven't been in the medical field. I was a hospital administrator or healthcare administrator, owned and ran nursing homes in Texas for several years. But I'm not a medical professional, nor am I a scientist, and, and therefore I, I, there's just no way I can make a decision for people. And uh, I think that has to be a personal decision. I think pastors are getting in trouble for trying to make that decision for their saints. Uh, <clears throat> there's just so much about it we don't know yet. And the Lord hasn't revealed, you know, uh, to us everything. So uh, I just think we're gonna have to leave that for a personal decision. And I don't think that, you know, I think it, the saints that don't feel to get it right now, um, you know, I don't feel like that I should be against them on that or the people that do feel to get it, that I should be against them on it. As far as I, you know, people ask me, yes, I've had both Pfizer vaccines, me and my wife both. I feel uh, myself, I feel, I felt, uh, okay in the Lord to do it. Uh, I, I do believe, you know, from my own personal feeling, I came to the decision that it was, uh, you know, that that getting it was uh, probably uh, better than getting the virus. We, we don't know the answers to all of that, but I just, I, uh, for myself and my family, I felt okay to, to get the get the vaccine. Again, that's just a decision that you'll all have to make for yourselves. But we're trying to be careful because there's still many people that don't have the vaccine and, it, and, it, and it's beginning to be younger people. So we do need to be careful. We need to continue to pray. We may not be over this pandemic till later in this year if we're over it at that time at all. School's going to start back up here pretty soon, and and uh, a lot of kids are going to be together, and this variant is uh, affecting the younger generation. So we have to, you know, we're just got to watch God and see. One of the things is, is that this pandemic has brought about a change in our world, our nation, our state, and our city. And so we're going to have to embrace this change. And I do believe God's in it. I don't think that God would allow something like this to even happen in the body of Christ if God wasn't uh, in it in a way that he wants us to consider. You know, Peter did say that judgment first begins at the house of God and God has not exempted his people from this. And so therefore, I think that Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, in the day of adversity, consider. I think we should consider that God's talking to us. And, uh, you know, the Lord has judged his people and judged other nations with pestilences and famines and wars and all kind of adversities. And I think when that uh, affects us, I think that we ought to consider God and begin to pray and ask God, is there something you wanting out of me? Do you want me to be more dedicated? Do you want me to get closer to you? Uh, I, I certainly think there's room for all of us to want to be closer to God than what we are, to get more dedicated to him. And so times like these, I think it's a time that we ought to be watching and praying. And Jesus said that, watch and pray concerning he told his disciples that concerning the the harvest end of the Jewish world. And we are certainly nearing the end of the Gentile world. And, and I think we ought to be considering God in all things. And everything that happens, 
uh, you know, so uh, I might want to, I'm going to say a few words here tonight uh, on the little book of Joel. Uh, I've talked on the second chapter several times to the church here, but uh, I think there's just three chapters. I don't know if I can cover it all here tonight, but let me give it a try and start in the first chapter of Joel and the first verse. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm have left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locusts have left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm have left hath the caterpillar eaten. Well, of course, this is prophetical scripture, and these four worms here in the book of Joel that Joel's prophesying about is referring to. Uh, the four uh, world powers or dragon powers, beginning with Babylon. Uh, Egypt and Assyria are the two that's prior to them. Uh, but uh, during Joel's time, it would start with Babylon and the Palmer worm, uh, here mentioned it refers to Babylon and what it doesn't destroy and its wicked rule of uh, as a dragon power then the locust which represents Medo-Persia the next world power that come into existence uh, is the next worm that destroyed and and was against the work of God the flesh is always against the work of God and of course, we're dealing here with nations that were not God, God's people. And so man has always uh, been adverse to the ways of God. That if you look at our nation today in the United States of America and other nations, you'll see that our forefathers have forgotten God. They have, they, their fear of God has left, left them. It's not in their thinking in fact, they rise up and try to twist scriptures to make it fit whatever, however they want it to be. Anyway, the canker worm here represents Greece, which is the third worm. And then the fourth worm, the caterpillar, is Rome, which that, of course, was in the days of Jesus, the Caesar of Rome. Rome ruled the world, but it continued down through after the judgment of the Jewish world and Rome destroyed the temple in Jerusalem uh, and the church fell away after God had harvested that world and of course Rome stayed in power and finally in AD 325 it, it remained Rome but it changed hands in the administration of it from a Caesar to the papacy the papacy gained control under Constantine and and uh, Rome continued in power until 1796 and so and I might mention right here that in Zechariah Zechariah in the first chapter uh, uh, in the 18th verse uh, Zechariah mentioned, he said, I lifted up my eyes and saw and beheld four horns. Horns and prophecy in the Bible represent powers. And he said, I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? The angel, and, the, and he answered, these are the horns which have scattered Jerusalem, Israel, and Jerusalem, uh, have scattered, I'm sorry, Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. These, these powers are the same as these four worms. These four powers 
that ruled over and was the dragon powers over uh, the Jews. But then he showed him four carpenters and showed him, uh, he said, then verse 21 said, then said I, what come these to do? And he spake saying, these are the horns which has scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which live, lifted up their horns over the land of Judah to scatter it. So God is going to raise up carpenters to restore that that's been torn down. And of course, this is talking about uh, all the way down in the end of the, uh, well, it extends all the way down through the Gentile times um, of the restoration of the church when God began to re started the Reformation uh, through reformers like Tyndale and Huss and, uh, and, and finally it was established much greater in a much greater way through Martin Luther in the 1500, early 1500s, I believe it was 1517, when he nailed his 95 theses on the Wittenberg uh, Germany Cathedral door uh, of the 95 points that he felt like that the Catholic Church was missing it. Uh, but, and that started the, the carpenters, that reformation started rebuilding what had been torn down by Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and finally Rome. And uh, God began to restore through that. And uh, we could give uh, the the carpenter's time frame in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations. We won't go there right now. Let me get back to Joel. In the fifth verse, it says, Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. And he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He's laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. He's just showing how these nations, these worms have uh, just, it's, it's, he's just giving a picture how these worms can destroy a vine or the fig tree. Uh, and so he says in verse eight, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for her husband of youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest and the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, you husband, how you vine dressers for the wheat and for the barley. For the, because the harvest of the field is perished. See, Israel was in a terrible condition because God uh, judged them because of their uh, sinful ways and their wickedness. And God put them in, in captivity, he did it more than once. Uh, God just kept his, you know, it may not look like it, but God's mercy, he was so merciful to Israel, uh, endeavoring to save what could be saved out of Israel that he just kept working with them, even when they turned against him and, and polluted the righteousness of God's holiness in the law. And uh, so that's what he's talking about here, just showing the condition uh, what does it say? Verse 13, gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, howl, you ministers of the altar, and come and lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. 
uh, this is talking about the end of the Jewish world. Joel's prophesying. If you remember, the um, on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he said, concerning the day of Pentecost, people receiving the Holy Ghost, the new birth. He, he, he began to proclaim and said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Uh, and, and, you know, he was showing that this is a fulfillment of what Joel was prophesying of. Well, I'm, I'm showing you in these three chapters here what Joel prophesied. Number one, alas for the day, the day of the Lord is at hand. Well, you have to understand the day of the Lord was a 45-year period. It's made up of a 30-year period and a 15-year period, the last prophetical hour, and it's made up of a prophetical month. That was the period of time from the, from, uh, from the, uh, day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the baptism of the Holy Ghost until AD 70, and even that judgment, I believe, lingered a few years after that. I don't think it just happened overnight. Now, the, the destruction of Israel did, but the judgment didn't cease. There were people uh, in the mountains. There were people that, you know, it was just pitiful. They starved to death. They were surrounded by the Roman uh, 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 army, Titus and his army, uh, was drove the people out. They didn't have any food or water in the mountains. Remember, Jesus said, pray that your flight be not in winter, and woe be unto them that give suck in those days. In other words, it'd be hard to flee the enemy with little babies. And people, not only did they, you know, and this is a terrible phraseology of what it came to, that they had, they ate their own dung and drank their own urine. Their children died. They ate their own children. Uh, it's just pitiful what took place. Uh, that happened in the siege of, of, of Babylon also to Israel. Uh, so, uh, the, and, but this day of the Lord that this is talking about was the judgment that was going to come upon Israel at the end of that 45-year period, that day of the Lord. Uh, you know, it's called a, a day of vengeance. It's also called uh, a day of, uh, how did Paul put that? Acceptance, acceptable year of the Lord. It was God's acceptable time that God had provided uh, the righteousness, the righteous understanding of the word of God and the help of the spirit that caused people to be acceptable to God in uh, responding to God's dealing with them and uh, developing them in the process of righteousness. And so... <clears throat> Uh, then verse 16 says, it is not the meat cut off before your eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under the clods. The garners are laid waste. The barns are broken down for the corn is withered. How do the beast groan? And the herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beast of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Just showing that the judgment of God that's coming on that land is going to be devastating. But then verse, chapter 2, he begins to give a little bit array of hope of what that time in the future is going to bring. And he says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. 
Remember, Peter said, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountain. A great people and a strong, there hath not ever been the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Here he's showing the Lord is coming. Uh, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. It's a, a day of clouds. It's, it's a day where it's fixing to rain. Fixing to, God's rain is fixing to come on the earth and produce uh, fruit. Uh, and, and then there's a great people. There's never been a people on the face of the earth ever like them. There never was a people like the New Testament church people that were born again of God's nature by the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost that continued through that harvest time, which was called the day of the Lord. Uh, and it says that there will not ever be any more people like this on the earth for many generations. Uh, that to me tells you that, and that's referring to the restored church in the end of the Gentile world, that God will, after many years, 2,000 years after the Jewish world, God dealt with the Jews for 2,000 years. He's going to deal with the Gentiles for 2,000 years and take the same amount of time to accomplish what God accomplished in that world, it will take that much time to accomplish it in this world. And uh, and it says in verse three, a fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth. That's judgment. Uh, and the land is as the garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. That is, and I've said this, many times that, you know, we want, we say we want a restored church and we should want a restored church. At the same time, you have to understand that a restored church is going to bring forth judgment under righteousness. And we better be ready to, because to him much is given is much required. God's going to require more out of us but we should want to be righteous. We should love righteousness and want God's judgment in our lives. This wording here, the fire devours before them, behind them the flame burns. The, the land is as the Garden of Eden before them. They're going back into the Garden of Eden. Uh, the, the early church did. That's a type of the holy place. Adam was removed from the garden condition and uh, a flaming sword was set up at, at, uh, uh, before the garden, uh, uh, two cherubims and a flaming sword turning every direction. And God said, now at least man put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life, which was in the midst of the garden, which is Christ, and live. So it shows there, there is a way, but you have to go through that flaming sword. That's God, the word of God and God's judgment. We'll have to go through God's judgment to get back into the garden where you're given, you've gained enough power in God and enough development and righteousness to live above sin. In fact, it was required of Adam. He could not sin in the garden. And I believe God's going to take us back in a place like that. Now, let me say something about a restored church. You know, sometimes we get it, we get it in our minds that a restored church is everybody's perfect in a restored church. That's not true. If you read the New Testament, uh, there was plenty of problems in the church, especially among Paul's works dealing with the Gentiles uh, and I'm sure it was the same with the Jewish apostles, the 12 apostles that was harvesting uh, the end of the Jewish world. But the apostle Paul was actually, he was planting uh, the seed of the word of God that would 
carry over down into the Gentile world. And it would take 2,000 years of us. That's why God gave us primarily in the New Testament, the writings of Paul and the words of God to the church of the Gentiles. We don't, as I've said here lately, we know very little about the works of the 12 apostles of the Jews. We're very limited on what we know that they actually did or have any writings of what they did. I, I have people bring Peter up to me, first and second Peter, but I've showed them where Peter was writing to Paul's churches. I read the first chapter and first verse of first Peter. Uh, and so uh, he was he was talking to Paul's churches and helping Paul out, dictating it to Silas. You read that in the fifth chapter. And uh, while Paul was in prison, well, <clears throat> so behind them was a desolate wilderness. That's the falling away of the church. That's the Gentile times after God judged Israel made up a portion of his bride and then turned to the Gentiles and started with a new world of the Gentiles. The Gentile world had began uh, in the things of God and God's been dealing with us for nearly 2,000 years. It's 2021 and, you know, if you use AD 33, uh, what, what year you used to, uh, as the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> we would have a 2,000 year world from then. And so we know we're getting down close to the end of the, of the Gentile world, but God's had to have a lot of patience with the Gentiles. And we still are not in a restored church, as I was gonna say a minute ago. Uh, there's always gonna be new people. There's always gonna be flesh. There's always gonna be ideology of man. There's always going to be some confusion in, in the body of Christ. But what is going to be restored is a truth of the word of God by God's restored ministry. I'm talking about the ministry that God has gave them, what he gave those early 12 apostles and Paul. Um, and there won't be any divisions. There won't be, and there will be a perfect order. There'll be a perfect order that the ministry will agree on. See, right now, we're not in agreement on everything. We're staying together. We realize we have to do that, and God helps us. But we still, and it's going to take God to restore some doctrine. It's got, well, he's, he's restored it all. But I'm saying to finish restoring, it's going to take God to do that, and it's going to take his time, his time frame and men that he's touched and give the revelation of the unadulterated word of God, the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, uh, God showed John an uh, angel or a messenger, a ministry that had the, that, that they had wings to fly in the midst of heaven. I believe that's the Old and New Testament, the wings that God's going to finally give us the, enough of the truth of the word of God that's going to get us in a second heaven condition. And they preach the everlasting gospel. That's the gospel that lasts forever. If I'm teaching something that's not true, that won't last forever. God will judge that. And we're in a place right now where we're having to say, God, this is the way I see this right now, but it helped me adjust it if it needs adjustment, if it's not the way I'm seeing it. God's going to have to do that for a latter reign ministry of the Gentile world. And so, and then he says here in the latter part of verse three, and nothing shall escape them. Now this is talking about the early church, the New Testament church. They judged everything. Every man was judged according to his deeds back then. We, we don't have that kind of judgment right now. We have judgment in a measure, but we don't have judgment in the same way that they had it yet. Because when God gives us a perfect order and a perfect understanding of the truth, then judgment will be much greater and much more severe 
than it is right now. God, you'll remember, and I, I, I hate to bring up bring this up, but it started the early church after the day of Pentecost, and Ananias and Sapphira went in and lied to Peter. The Bible said he lied, lied to the Holy Ghost, and God struck them both dead. And the Bible said fear fell on them all. Well, it showed you there was a change took place right there. That just, that they were bringing and they sold what they had. They just kept back part of the money, but they were given the, the, the vast majority of it to the church, it looked like. But they lied about giving it all. They said they gave it all. There's where they lied. And God killed them over that. God judged them. And fear came on the whole church because of that. They saw, ooh, there's a change here. God's not, God's not tolerating anything but absolute. God's requiring us to live absolutely true and right. And so uh, that, that will happen down here. Uh, God's going to cause us to, in, in a change, nothing is going to escape. No one's going to escape God's judgment. And I know, I, you know, I understand that I'm preaching a solemn message that, that sounds pretty severe, but I think the saints of God needs to know this, that it is. That's why I think we should get close to God. I think we should try to live a, our lives uh, dedicated right now. I think we're living in a time that it looks like to me God's requiring us to come up another notch. There's a change taking place in the world. Uh, we're seeing several things. Our government has, has got, they've, taken, they've added more teeth to their judgment. See, there, our Constitution says there's things in America that, that they cannot violate, but they've decided that in a time of a pandemic or an emergency, that they can override the Constitution and make us do whatever they say to do. I mean, they, they in certain states, it was against the Constitution, but they forbid some churches even for having church. Uh, and I know in California, they put a man in, in jail for having church because they said he couldn't have church during the time of the pandemic, you could have a you could you could have a a uh, uh, what do they call it? It's not necessarily a riot, but where protesters come together, thousands of them could come together and protest, uh, but but you couldn't gather for a church service. See, there are our government's out of whack, you might say, out of balance. Um, anyway. Uh, let's read uh, let's read down here just a minute. Verse 4 says, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains shall they leap. See, here's a place in prophecy that shows that in prophecy the church is, picked, is depicted as the appearance of horses. That's where we, one of the places that we get that the four horses uh, in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse represent the church. And uh, that, 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 that the horses represent the church in prophecy. Uh, they leap like the noise of a flame of fire they, that devoured the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. I see this is talking about this great people that there's never been anybody like them. This is talking about the New Testament church. Uh, verse six, before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They'll climb like the wall climb the wall like men of war and they shall march every one on his ways and they shall not break their ranks. See, that's just showing the order of the early church. They, they did not break ranks. There was an order in that church 
And that order was followed and everyone was obedient to the order of God. And uh, see, today there's a lot of people that don't feel like that it's necessary to work in order. I mean, I've got people that won't even tell us if they're not going to be in church. They, they absolutely refuse to just, what you know, if you had a job, you think you could just not call in on your job and tell your boss that I won't be able to work today, I'm sick or, you know, I, you know my car's broke down or whatever. But, and you don't think the church is more important than a job? You don't think that ought to be the main thing in your life of serving God or to be the first and foremost thing in your life, but yet there's not enough order to even be accounted for. See, there needs to be an accountability to the Lord. Every man needs to be accountable to somebody. You know, I don't even miss church without letting the leaders of the church know where I'm going to be. You know, I, 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 even when I was in Babylon, I never did that. I never missed church without my pastor knowing that I wasn't going to be there. A lot of people, well, I'm just not going to go into all that. But that's just the truth. There's people been going to church for years and they think they're righteous, but they don't have any order. They, there's no order in their lives. They don't communicate. They, look, I'm showing you here. They don't, this church didn't break ranks. I understand that because I was in the United States Army and you didn't break ranks when you was in the Army. Uh, we had a formation. Every man had a place in the formation to be. You had a way to march. Even every man's foot, every man's right foot had to be set down in a march right at the exact time that everybody's right foot sat down, left foot, your left foot, right foot, they were all in order. It was that we did not break ranks and we didn't get out of our place in formation uh, as we traveled together. And it's the, it was the same way in, in, uh, in war as well, the platoons, the companies, the battalions, they had, they had an order about, about them. Uh, then verse 8 says, neither shall one thrust another. Uh, they shall walk every man in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. That's talking about the word of God. Every man would walk uh, in his path where God put him in his place. And if you fell on the sword, and that's talking about the word of God, See, if you're living righteously, the, the word of God can, you, it can be applied anywhere in your life and it won't hurt you because there's no sin to judge. There's no place that it would, you'd be wounded because a sword of the word of God was applied to your life. Verse nine, they shall run to and fro in the city and they shall run upon a wall and climb upon the houses and they'll enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens will tremble. The sun and moon shall be dark and the stars will withdraw their shining. That is, their judgment will finally uh, put out the lights. When God judges a, a, a world, when God does that, you know, if there's a leading, excuse me, if there's a leading like these dragon powers, when God put out, when he put Pharaoh out, he, the moon turned to blood, the sun went to blackness, the stars fell from heaven because Egypt was a light to the world. It's just like today, America is a light to this world. The whole world's watching America. Now, <clears throat> she hasn't done too good here in the last few years I'm sure there's several nations that that's looking down on uh, the nation that they've always looked to, but uh, but when God judges a nation, He'll put the lights out. God turned the lights out back here uh, when God judged the the Jewish world back there. Uh, uh, God turned those lights out. Uh, and the Lord, verse 11, shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, and he is strong that executed his word. 
for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Well, the ones that will abide it will be God's people. God's people, God will prepare them for it and they won't be, they, they will not be uh, hindered. In fact, they'll just get stronger. But the judgment of God will, will take place to the rest of the world. God's going to judge the wicked and, and preserve the righteous before it's over with. Verse 12 says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will re return and repent and leave a blessing behind, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, um, Gather the children and those that suck the breast. This is talking about that the breast of the word of God, the milk, the babes. Paul said, babes, you know, they they need milk, but those that are full age, uh, strong meat belongeth to them. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among them, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil. That's that's the word of God. Corn, the wine is the spirit of God, and the oil is, is understanding. Uh, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, that's Babylon, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beast of the field, for the pastors of the wilderness do spring for the tree beareth her fruit and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Let me explain that just a moment. What he's talking about there is, is God's going to bring a harvest and that he would bring the former rain, that is the early rain, and that would come in the first month of the agricultural year, which would be equivalent to our September or early October. And the, and the latter rain would be in the first month of what would be equivalent to us of being uh, March or, or April. Uh, that's the latter rain. You know, I've explained it many times how Israel had two calendars. Their, the first month of their agricultural calendar started after the harvest year was finished in September or early October, where they plowed up their barley and wheat fields and planted new seed and waited for the early rains, which is just opposite of the way we look at it today. Their fall rains was their early rains. See, we look at our spring rains as early rains. They looked at that because they planted their barley and wheat after the harvest year and in the beginning of their agricultural year. But they also had a spiritual calendar that started, uh, it started in the Passover. 
and that they adjusted their calendar by by the when the barley got ripe. If it didn't get ripe in the right month, then they adjusted their calendar. Uh, and that month uh, was when uh, the month of Abib, wasn't it? That they that was the first month of the year for their religious or spiritual calendar, and that started uh, the the early rains fell, and and that month. They, they had those rains and it produced, it finished producing the harvest of barley. And then of course, wheat was after that about six weeks later. So, or, or maybe a little longer, but anyway, so that that's what this is talking about. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. They didn't get all that rain just in one month, but it was the first month of both calendars when the early rain fell and the latter rain fell. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. See, the wine came from a grape harvest because after barley and wheat, then they had grapes, then they had figs, then they had olives, they, they had um, all of their fruits, they had their nuts. The harvest for the whole year from, from the latter rains, which was their spring rains, that lasted all year until the fall of the year. It was over. They had the Feast of Tabernacles and rejoiced in the harvest that God gave them that year and uh, had the atonement to forgive all sins for that year. And uh, then the, they planted, plowed their fields, replanted their barley and wheat and the, the early rains fell that, start, that was far to bring about a new harvest the, the next year. Uh, that that year's harvest time. It started in the fall, and of course it ended in the fall again. Uh, let's see. And verse 25 said, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canger worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, and my great army which I sent among you and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. See, God's gonna restore uh, what these uh, these dragon powers, uh, he's gonna rebuild, I mean, what they destroyed. And you'll know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. And it'll come to pass after that that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will see dreams, shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I'll show wonders in heaven and in earth, and blood and fire and pillars of smoke, and the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. My God, saints, that should make us want to call on the name of the Lord to keep us, you know, brother, I was talking to brother Scott York and brother Durham yesterday, and brother Durham was just mentioning him and his wife had just read the book of Nehemiah and he just mentioned how Nehemiah's mentioned three times during the time that he was praying for the natural restoration of the, the temple. And he said, um, uh, he told the Lord three times, he said, God, remember me. <laughs> well, because uh, he, you know, it was a great, work that was going on and he wanted to be a part of it. And he wanted God to remember him. He didn't want to be left out of it. Well, I don't want to be left out down here in the end of the harvest of the, uh, of the Gentile world. I want to be a part of that. And uh, what does it say? And in the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call 
well, I want to be in the remnant down here. I know that there will only be a remnant out of all, all of this wickedness and all of Babylon. There will only be a remnant when you look at I mean, it'll be a multitude of people, but it'll be a remnant compared to the great number of people that miss it. Like Jesus said when he said, uh, how did he say it? He said, uh, It'll be as it was in the days of Noah. Men will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage. In other words, men will just go right on doing what they've always done, and they won't even know that Jesus came. They won't even have a clue. See, a lot of people don't know Jesus came back there in the end of the Gentile, of the end of the Jewish world. In the New Testament times, he came there. He made up a portion of his bride it, those people finished their work in God and God started all over with a new Gentile world and here it is 2,000 years later and Jesus is coming again exactly the same way and people will be just like they were in the days of Noah. They'll be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, not believing that it's going to rain and that God's going to shut the door to the ark. It'll be the same way down here. People will just go right on doing what they're doing, believing what they want to believe. People think they can read the Bible. They don't need a ministry to explain it to them that God gave. Look what it says. Read the fourth chapter of Ephesians. He gave some apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints of God. How are you going to get perfected without a ministry? God's called and gave gifts of the ministry to help the people of God. It's not natural. It's not a natural gift. Everybody don't have that gift. God's called certain men. It's a special calling. No man can call himself to it. And God gives a gift of the ministry to help perfect or mature the saints of God. That's why. Paul said, forsake not the uh, gathering of yourselves together as the, as, as the manner of some is, you know. But God set that up. There has to be a church. You have to be a part of a church. People say, I don't need a church to be saved. No, you can be saved without a church, but you can't be saved eternally without one. It'll take a ministry to perfect you, to cause you to be mature in God you'll have to have someone explain to you the word of God and it will have to be anointed in such a way that God, that you know God touched your ears when you heard it. It's not just a man talking, but it's an anointed word of God that God's involved in. It. Anyway, the third chapter, this is the last chapter here. Let me see if I can get through it. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I'll also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Uh, th this is talking about in the end of the Jewish world, God was going to judge that world. The, the, the valley of Jehoshaphat, the word Jehoshaphat means God judges. It's always been wondered, what is this valley? Where is this valley? Is it the Kidron Valley? There, it's always been wondered. But actually, God's just, he's using this in prophecy that there is a judgment. God's judgment. God's going to put his people, he later calls this the valley of decision, that God's going to manifest himself in the end of this world, and people are going to have to decide. They're going to have to make a decision to obey God and go with God's people or to go with the world, which at that time is going to be the beast system. And if you don't know what the beast system is, you will be deceived by it. There's no question in my mind about that. You'll have to know what it is or it will. you will be deceived by it. Um, let's see. And they have cast, verse 3, and they have cast lots for my people and given a boy for a harlot, sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yea, and what have you to do with me, O the coast of Palestine? Will you render 
me a recompense, and if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Here's when he's saying, you've given a boy for a harlot. I'm sure back in, in, in the time of Joel, he's using that, but he's projecting down here God's judgment. A boy for a harlot. In other words, they would sell an Israelite boy into slavery to pay for the what they, you know, were able, what pleasure they could get from a harlot. They took no, they had no feeling for life, for for the 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 precious life that God had gave. Sold a girl for wine. In other words, they'd sell a girl. They'd they'd, they'd give up their daughter or their for uh, just for a party. Uh, but that even goes deeper than that. In other words, you just can see the out of balance that in man, that they'll, they will give up uh, what's right for a little bit of fun, to have a little bit of pleasure to the flesh. And, and, and you'll give up your soul for that, basically what that's talking about. Yea, verse four, and what have you to do with me? O Tyre, Zidon, and all you coast of Palestine, will you? What will you render me for a recompense? And if you re recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? In other words, you're you're not going to be able to satisfy God. He's talking to the to the heathen. Uh, how are you going to satisfy me with your wickedness? Because you've taken my silver, my gold, and have carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. See, he's going back now showing the condition in Joel's day, but it does apply to this prophecy pointing towards, and he'll do that here in a minute. Look in verse nine, it says, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war, wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all you heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put in thy sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Now see, this is talking about the harvest. It's talked about the same thing's going to happen down here in Revelations 4.19. Uh, God <coughs> already mentioned that he was harvesting his bride his bridegroom was going forth for his bride, but here God's not just got one harvest for the right, righteous, but he's also harvesting the wicked. He's saying, put in your sickle for the harvest is ripe. For the press is full, the fats overflow for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened. The stars will withdraw their shining. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. And there shall be no strangers pass through her any more. And it'll come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and the fountains shall come forth from the house of the Lord and shall water uh, the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation. You see the contrast here, he's gonna judge the wicked, but he's gonna bless his people. There's a scripture in Haggai where it says that uh, the the 
the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. A lot of people misinterpret that scripture. They think that, that you know, uh, that, the, that when they rebuilt, when Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt the temple, that that rebuilding of the temple was going to be, the glory of God would be greater in it than the temple Solomon built. And that's a misunderstanding of that scripture. It's talking about the New Testament, the spiritual temple. The glory of that spiritual temple would be greater than the former, than, than the natural temple under the law is what that's talking about. Well, he's talking about here how he's going to judge. And it's mentioned, I'll close with this, in Revelations, the 14th chapter, and this is talking about us down here. Uh, in the 14th verse, it shows first the, the, the harvest of the church, that God's going to harvest, thrust into the sickle, he says. In the um, 14th verse, it shows one like unto the Son of Man sitting on a white cloud, and he had a golden crown on his head, which was his the wisdom of God that was in the headship of Christ and in his hand, his ministry, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. And in, that's his hand. And in his hand was a sickle. That's the word of God. That's how he's going to harvest this world down here with the word of God by a ministry. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice. I'm in verse 15, Revelation 14, verse 15. To him that sat on the cloud, he said, thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time for thee is come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud, thrust in his sickle, that cloud's a restored church, second heaven condition. Thrust in your sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped and another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice. So he had power over judgment, fires, judgment, and prophecy. A loud cry to him that had sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the wine, the vine of the earth and cast it into a, the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even to the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's talking about the judgment of the wicked in the end of this Gentile world. God's first going to judge his church and he's going to reap a harvest of righteousness, uh, the righteous saints of God, uh, but the wicked. You know, there's a lot of people today think they're righteous and they ain't no more righteous or wicked as the ungodly. And they may have some knowledge about God, but they got all this ideology in their mind that, that makes them think that they're righteous when they're not righteous at all. I'm telling you, righteousness is righteousness. It's never telling a lie. It's not even telling a little white lie. It's never having the wrong spirit. It's not, uh, you know, having a lot of ideologies in your mind, but it's knowing God's word and, the, and it's serving God according to his word and his righteousness, not your righteousness, but his righteousness. When God gets through judging the church, and I'll say this before I get off of here, that judgment's not bad not God's judgment. God's judgment's good. First, it's information. It's God instructing you with information concerning his will, his righteousness. See, God don't want to be, he's not just wanting to be your boss. He just wants you to learn his righteous ways. He wants you to be righteous. And he knows you're going to have to have an accountability. You're going to have to have an instructor. You're going to have to have someone that will chastise you if you don't do right. If you, if God loves you, the Bible said he chastises those that he loves. 
Well, that's because he wants you to be saved. And sometimes God has to, he has to use the word of God on us and chastise us somewhat to get us to straighten up. <coughs> but then his, his judgment starts off with instruction and then it's corrective judgment. God will, he'll deal with you and he'll be merciful to you for a great time. Right now, God's not, he's not being real harsh because he understands that there's a lot of confusion in this world, even in Christianity. So God's tolerating more than he would normally. But the closer you get to God, the more you know him, the more he requires out of you, which he should. You shouldn't be always a baby, but you ought to grow up to where you understand God and it, and you know that he may not judge a babe in Christ, but he will judge me because I've been serving him too long and I know better. See, God judges you according to your knowledge. And so God has a corrective judgment. And then he also has a chastising judgment. He will do more than just correct you with his words or with uh, mercy, but God can get more severe in judgment. And finally, his judgment can be eternal. God's, finally, ju God's judgment can be punishment. And so, uh, but, it, but God's judgment is it's not all bad. It's good. If we heed God's judgment, his word, then there, it's like I read in the book of Joel. You can fall on the word of God and it won't hurt you. You won't be wounded at all. If, if you're doing right, someone can apply the word of God to you and it won't hit you anywhere. It won't, it won't, you won't be wounded by it. Anyway, when God finished with his judgment of his people and finishes making up his bride that'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years, uh, he will finish his work with the, among the Gentiles and the millennial reign will start after the battle of Armageddon that'll bring the final judgment on this Gentile world. All right, well, we did get through the three chapters of the book of Joel. Uh, I know it was somewhat hurriedly, but this will be on our Facebook page for a while, and you can listen to it again. You can go back and listen to it again if you'd like. So let me thank all of you for coming uh, and to our broadcast today, and, and uh, I'd like to tell all of you to watch and pray. Consider, uh, you need to, uh, you know, you need to be considering God now, praying, trying to get close to the Lord. And uh, so just, just want to thank all of you for, for being with us tonight. And uh, you can always text me or email me any questions that you might have, I'll be glad to try to help you with any of that. Uh, remember, if you would, I'll just mention these prayer requests. Brother Goss in Keswick, Canada, he is going home, I believe, Monday from the hospital, but he's not, his condition is, he's, he may have improved some, but he's still in a very dire condition. So he still needs our prayers. Uh, Pray for the body of Christ. Uh, you know, pray for Brother Bill Daniels in our church. Sister Brenda Ratliff certainly needs our prayers. She, I need her to, she, I told her some time ago, she probably shouldn't come to church in her condition with COVID. Uh, in the future, I think God, you know, it'd be all right for her to come back. We're not having any, any problems, but right now with this spike, we're still being a little bit careful uh, who else do I need to mention? Sister Cindy, my daughter-in-law, Michael and Cindy, Cindy's mother, Sister Angie Elder. She needs a touch from God in her body. She's got a heart condition. You know, God's still a God of miracles. He could still touch her and she could, uh, she could live out the rest of her life without a heart condition. God's able to do that. So we need to pray. We we need to petition the Lord for these needs. I mentioned Brother Bill Daniels. He's been on my heart. Uh, I want God to touch that man. Uh, I'm asking God to consider him and his faithfulness and touch him. 
Also, Brother Ray Weaver certainly needs a touch from God, him and his wife, Susan. Oh, so many that we could mention. Sister uh, Julie Crafton has had a stroke and she's, she's doing good, improving, but we want to keep praying for her and asking God to deliver her. And so uh, I know there are others that have been mentioned, but those are the, the most drastic needs right now. I'm asking you to put it on your prayer list. Pray for the Dominican Republic. Pray for Brother Johnny Bud's works, Nacogdoches and Sebastopol and Brownsville and uh, the works there under Brother Rodriguez and Brother Memo Cano in Mexico that are, that are working with them. There's a ministry that, you know, a council that we're working with those brethren and, and trying to help that work. So be in prayer with us. Anytime there's a great leader that dies, there's somebody said it's crisis time for their their works, and it is because change and the loss of leadership is it's very difficult for people to embrace change and be able to go through change. So they do need our prayers and our our support. I ask you to pray for them. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. I love the people of God. Uh, I'll see those of you that are here. Uh, locally, I'll see you Sunday morning at church, 9.30 breakfast downstairs, uh, 10 o'clock Bible study, and then 11.30 worship service upstairs. Uh, I might mention for the local people that next week on the 22nd and 23rd, there's a joint fellowship meeting in, in uh, Sykeston, Missouri, and in Cape Girardeau. Uh, Brother Bobby Mauser and Brother uh, Wren are, they're having a fellowship meeting Thursday night in uh, Sykeston and Friday and Friday night in uh, Cape Girardeau. They're only about 30 miles apart. And so uh, if some of the saints uh, here in Little Rock would like to go to that meeting, well, uh, you can ask me more about it, but those are the dates of it and the places, and you'd be you'd be welcome to go. All right, God bless your hearts. I'll talk to you later.